Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to introduce Maike Richter, who will uh, give a talk about scarcity is entering the net. Well, there are some things to tell about scarcity. We all know oil is running out and it's limited supply. On the other hand, there are artificial scarcities. There is no reason why information would, would be scarce because it can be easily copied and easily transported. And well, I think that's a bit of the, the, the gist that Michael, Michael Richter, Rich, Richter will tell us tonight. Enjoy her, her speech. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome once more. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, digital uh, sustainability uh, today, but before I do that, I uh, want to introduce myself. So uh, I work as a journalist and um, I sometimes lecture at, at a university and I focus on internet culture and on political aspects of the internet. Okay, and today I want to talk about um, yeah, a digital uh, sustainability. And at first it sounds uh, really weird to hear the term sustainability um, when you know, talking of digital things and of the internet because um, sustainability, the whole concept, the whole framework of it is very much tied to the analog world, uh, to the meat space, and keywords here, environment and environment uh, protection. And the bottom line is always uh, when people talk of sustainability that, you know, we have to take care of our resources because they are endless. And uh, on the contrary, um, on the internet, we do have something like uh, paradise-like circumstances or yeah, paradise-like characteristics because uh, by default on the internet, we have um, absence of scarcity because um, information grows by sharing and you just cannot use it up. And um, I've been asked uh, three times what sustainability means, uh, so I just want to say the German word, so maybe some other guys don't know. So that simply means Nachhaltigkeit. And uh, scarcity means Knappheit. Okay, so um, and the main argument of my lecture is that although uh, we can say maybe that in the original internet we did have this paradise-like circumstances that information grows by, by sharing. And my main argument here is that there are certain legal, political and technical parameters which uh, reduce information flow. And uh, so we do need a framework or concepts of, for, uh, for concepts of sustainability for the net as well. So what can you expect from the next uh, half an hour? So we'll talk about uh, concepts of su sustainability on and offline, and then I will present uh, the threats, you know, the powers which are starting to introduce uh, scarcity to uh, the net. And we have here intellectual property rights, and then the soul cease and desist mania, and I will talk um, of the uh, principle of net neutrality, what that is, and that it's being undermined. Uh, one, uh, another important issue are security measures, and then I will very briefly talk about the uh, difficulties when you try to um, preserve information. If you have questions of understanding, feel free to ask, but let's do the discussion of the whole issue after the lecture. Okay, so there's this big myth, a very beautiful myth as well, and I'm sure uh, everyone in the room uh, has heard of it, and maybe some of you guys still believe it. And the myth goes like this, uh, that uh, on the internet there's space for everybody, for every activity, and for every opinion. So, but the sad uh, truth is that the informational sphere is massively under attack, and that the era of information overflow is definitely coming to an end. Okay, so what does uh, sustainability uh, really mean? So that's a term that you know, comes from the uh, industri industrial age, it comes from the offline world, because the poor and sad offline world has to deal with this uh, feature of uh, 
scarcity. So um, what I mean with this is that uh, whatever good you take, you know, be it oil or be it food or wood or whatever material good, there's always too little of it for everyone. So and this is why a fair distribution of the material goods or of material resources is just an impossible dream. Uh, and uh, even worse, the uh, exploitation of these material uh, resources is harming our uh, environment and is uh, destroying the planet. So, and so what does sustainability really mean? There are tons and tons of definitions of it, but the, or two of the most popular ones go like this, that we shouldn't uh, consume more um, than can be regenerated, so what you know, can be grown after and that people should uh, preserve their environment and their resources uh, not only for themselves but as well for future generations. Uh, but we are already uh, nose deep in the famous information age, age or we as well can call it network society or information society or knowledge society, they all kind of mean the same and this is um, that it's not any more material resources anymore, uh, which are sources of wealth and power, but it's information, information and knowledge. And so they are uh, yeah, the oil of the 21st century, we can say, and information has become a much, much uh, contested trade commodity. Uh, and my argument is that exactly how the exploitation of oil, for example, is um, destroying whole landscapes or like, you know, too much fishing is destroying uh, the sea, um, the ruthless exploitation uh, of the resource information is as well harming our online environment and the privatization of information. But uh, like every school kid knows about sustainability in the analog world and knows uh, what it's all about, but really there's a, uh, an absence of a political framework or an absence for most people. Um, they just don't uh, you know, think uh, of, um, of that we do have to uh, come up with some you know, frameworks in order how to uh, preserve um, the uh, digital world and this is especially kind of strange because we shift our lives more and more onto the online world. So I do think it's a very big uh, mistake that uh, there's an absence of ideas uh, and uh, absence of political frameworks uh, in order to protect the net uh, because it is pretty much in danger. Uh, so what are the dangers? Uh, I'm going to present them now. I want to start with intellectual property rights with uh, copyright. So copyright never really was a big issue before the internet came. That was like an issue for uh, specialists. But then the net became a mass medium and the whole uh, system uh, broke down. I mean, just uh, as the music industry, they really can tell stories uh, of this. So why did the whole system um, broke down? Because um, in the with the net and with all the digital technologies around, um, like one file, like one music file or film file, whatever you name it, is enough to supply uh, all internet users of the world because um, a free copying is simply a characteristic of the net. Like every time we use digital technologies, every time we use the net, we simply do um, copies. So this is the absence of a scarcity thing I, I talked in the beginning. And of course, this um, characteristic, this free copying, is uh, threatening uh, business models which are designed for the analog world. And their reactions uh, of these uh, firms uh, is uh, threefold. So I'm talking now mostly about um, uh, media firms. Um, and then we have like a legal layer of this reaction. So we see a massive uh, um, exaggeration and, th and a strengthening of copyright law. That is a worldwide phenomenon. And then we have a technical layer. So we see the introduction of technologies like uh, digital rights management, or some call it digital restrictions management, uh, depends on the side you're on. And these technologies, of course, um, 
are, are a barrier from copying information, from copying things. And then we see a flood of lawsuits for file sharers, but as well uh, to kind of normal um, users. Because my main argument here is that um, when you use, uh, like, an average person who is using the internet is violating copyright law all the time, just by day-to-day -day action. And effects are um, devastating because a very strong copyright is harming free speech, and as well, you know, expression of creative practices, practices is suppressed. Um, I'm not really talking about this whole file sharing issue. What I'm talking about is, for example, how average people use the internet and use digital technologies. Uh, for example, you, when I was a kid, we kind of did collages from newspapers. But today, these kids, um, they sample together music and sounds, and maybe then they post it onto, the, onto their websites, and then, of course, they can get into a legal uh, hassle very easily, and that can be pretty costly. And uh, as well, um, creative people are as well harmed by a way too strong copyright law, uh, because w when you want to you do something new, you have to have access to a creative pool of other or older creative works. Like, no composer can compose something new, you know, without knowing um, works. Uh, from the past, but if you have like on everything uh, copyright and you just cannot use stuff or um, you have to do uh, rights clearings before you can publish your things, uh, we do have a problem because then only people can be creative who have, for example, a major record label uh, in their back who do have the resources in order to pay, you know, for all the lawyers' bills. So in the end, uh, copyright law, because it's so absolutely becoming so strong, it uh, does censor you know, certain behavior, and it's really day-to-day -day behavior, how people use the net, um, and certain information uh, becomes scarce. Uh, certain information is not making it to the Internet. Uh, another aspect of intellectual property right uh, are um, patents, and I only want to talk about software patents and really briefly on the surface just to introduce uh, the issue. Um, so copyright you get onto creative works and patents you get uh, for technical innovations. And this whole system really kind of um, went uh, the wrong way when the patent agencies started to grant patent on very trivial things. Not like a real innovation, but, you know, patents on ideas, uh, on business models, uh, for example. So today we do have the situation that it's not anymore the best innovators that succeed, but it's very often uh, the party with the biggest budget for patent clearings. Because um, as there are so many um, patents on trivial, trivial um, things, it's very easy that you uh, do violate um, uh, a patent of, of another party. So there are these uh, very famous trivial patents. So Amazon is having some, some weirdo one, for example. There's a patent on when you buy in an online store something and then you send it to someone as a present. So they do have a patent on this, on everyone else who's having an online shop and is putting this feature into his own online shop is actually violating this Amazon patent. I already had one of the one-click um, payment, you know, this feature where you just can have a book and then go one-click bestellung, I just forgot the English word. They did have a pattern on this, but they're losing this pattern right now. So what's uh, the problem with these, you know, very strong intellectual property rights concerning uh, the issue of patents? Well, uh, software is the language of the information age, so everything is code, and if there are only very few people um, uh, are able to really speak this language because only very few people uh, do have the resources, you know, to always pay for the patent clearings, uh, we do have a problem and of course certain innovations or certain software is not making it to the internet. Uh, to sum this um, part about intellectual property rights up, so famous uh, Larry Lessig has put it into some you know, you know, nice uh, words. So Larry Lessig is a, 
uh, American law professor and uh, very known uh, you know, fighter for free speech, and he says that we are moving to a, something like we can call a permission culture. culture. So every time you want to do something on the net, you kind of have to ask, oh, am I violating someone's copyright laws or am I violating someone's patent laws? Um, and if the answer is, well, yes, you do violate my, uh, my copyright or my patent, then, you know, people just cannot start to be uh, active. And in the end, uh, certain innovations or things or ideas just don't make it to the net. And the effect is, you know, we have less nice applications and things and ideas and creative works on the internet. Okay, then we have the soul uh, cease and uh, desist mania. One question, can you hear me loud and clear? Yeah. Fine, okay. So, I mean, blogs and the internet as a whole is seen as a very um, a great tool for democratization and a very neat tool for public uh, debate. And, um, well, this maybe uh, or this might have been true, uh, but uh, that, um, this kind of stopped, you know, when other um, kind of um, discovered this whole. Uh, you can very easily um, stop or press public discussions about critical issues by sending cease and desist letters. And on the slide, we see uh, Stefan Negemeyer, and he's uh, one of the best German journalists. Uh, and he's also a blogger, and right now he's, for example, writing a lot about um, the kind of, let's say, weird business models of call-in TV shows, you know, where you, uh, when you have, have a show on TV and then you call, and maybe you can win something, but it's more likely that not. And so he has problem of just, you know, writing about this issue because he's getting so many cease and desist letters. And this is then, of course, a very neat way in order to uh, suppress a discussion about it. Um, now I'm uh, getting to a, to a technical uh, issue, the end-to-end -end argument. That sounds kind of dry, but it's a very, very beautiful uh, feature of the net. Maybe you guys already have asked yourself, so how do all these neat uh, applications enter the net? You know, be it whatever, voice over IP or peer-to-peer, -peer, BitTorrent, or the early things like email or chat. Well, um, this all entered the net because uh, of its very open design principle, and it's called end-to-end. -end. And to make it really short, um, this end-to-end -end argument um, means that all the intelligence uh, on the net is situated at the end host, so like on my laptop or on servers. And the network itself, itself is not doing anything else than just, you know, forwarding innovation. That was, um, uh, sorry, um, just uh, forwarding um, data packages. So the, in the original internet, we have to talk of the original internet, it just couldn't look up uh, into the data packages and see what is this or where does it come from. It just was really dumb and just, you know, forwarded all the data um, Packages. And this is why we have so many innovation on, uh, on the internet, because, for example, uh, Sean Fanning, the, uh, the first guy who did a peer-to-peer um, um, -peer network, he didn't have to ask anyone, hey, I have this cool innovation, can I please put it onto the internet? So he just did it, and then other people put it onto their uh, computers, and the whole thing worked. And this is why the power of the net comes from its borders. Uh, so, Sean Fanning, for example, from Napster, he did not have to ask the owners of the network, please, can I um, implement this? He just did it. He didn't have to ask anyone. But uh, times are changing, and now we have this issue of net neutrality uh, on the agenda, and I'm pretty sure that this issue will be like the, one of the most important issues uh, in the next years. So what does it mean? It simply means the equal treatment of data traffic, so independent of source or service or um, broadband consumption. And then we do have gatekeepers, for example, the big telecommunication 
uh, companies, so uh, the guys uh, who own uh, the networks or as well internet service providers, they would love to have a say. They want to be asked when someone, for example, is putting a new application to the internet. Uh, for example, um, voice over IP. This is, uh, you know, a business or telephony over the internet that is, of course, um, uh, interfering, inter interfering with uh, the basic discipline of telecommunication um, uh, companies. And there have been cases, um, for example, Vonage is a voice over IP service in the, in the, in the United States. And in 2004, uh, the, the service of Vonage uh, was kind of, you know, slowed down by um, the telecommunication um, owners. So this whole net neutrality uh, thing is not something ac academic. There are already cases where the owners of networks or other gatekeepers um, do uh, use their power because this end-to-end -end kind of stopped. So now we do have a lot of intelligence in the network itself. It's became kind of smart and it do can look into data packages and it do can um, discriminate certain applications or certain information. Uh, and there's one uh, um, American law professor, lots of American law professors here in this lecture, his name is Tim Wu, and he calls uh, the end of net neutrality and this whole discrimination of certain data traffic a Tony Soprano model. So like, it's like a mafia-like because they want to kind of have a say in things and they want to tell people, for example, okay, you want to do voice over IP on my network, okay, but then you have to pay me extra. Um, or they maybe say, oh, you want to do BitTorrent? Well, you know, that's so many broadband consumption. You, maybe you can do it, but then you have to pay me extra, for example. There's like a nice German word for it. It's Wegelagerei. I find it kind of uh, um, matching for this. So what's uh, the problem when net neutrality is about to stop? Well, of course, certain innovation becomes scarce. So just think of... Uh, the um, inventors of uh, BitTorrent, for example, if they do have to ask first the owners of the network, hey, I have something like BitTorrent, uh, can I please, you know, put it onto the internet? And of course, answers will very often be a no or a yes, but you have to pay me extra. And of course, most people just cannot do it. Another issue is that uh, certain content uh, becomes scarce, so critical content. Um, because if a network owners are able to look into data packages and, of course, if the possibility is there in order to stop certain information flow, whatever, political information, uh, of course, this uh, chance, you know, will be taken and certain uh, content or certain information will be having trouble in order to uh, get through. And in the end, it all means uh, in the end uh, uh, of a free information flow, let's say it's um, let, that certain information will have uh, trouble getting through. Next big issue are uh, security measurements. I as well only want to talk briefly about it because at this Congress are lots of lecturers who deal with this whole security weirdo things which are happening right now. Uh, well, uh, good news, at least if you are a police officer, uh, the internet is much, much easier to control than the meat space. Uh, of course, it's impossible to put, uh, it is impossible to put a police officer uh, into every family in order to monitor whom they are meeting and whom they are calling, but this is uh, pretty easy to do um, with the digital technologies. It's way easier to do that on the net. So we have the issue of data retention in Germany, but that's as well an issue in uh, other um, countries as well. Uh, data retention means uh, Vorratsdatenspeicherung. And uh, so data retention makes possible uh, the storage of internet traffic, telephony and email. So it's like a huge project of mass surveillance and the people who um, uh, do uh, this surveillance are then, um, for them it's then possible to identify relationships, uh, business contacts, and of course they do can, you know, analyze this and get hints of the interests of people. 
We as well have the issue of the Bundestrojaner, but I just want to mention it. I just don't I want to talk about it. Um, there are so many more uh, security, uh, security measure, measures which are uh, entering the debate. Um, and I always have to think of uh, that um, what people um, or what science fiction authors, uh, you know, kind of imagine themselves. This is right now already coming true. For example, um, maybe uh, some of you guys know the movie Minority Report. That was like a major Hollywood movie a couple of years ago with Tom Cruise, but it's based on a novel by Philip K. Dick, and he wrote it in the 1950s. And there he imagined, you know, something that uh, that uh, police force can um, kind of uh, monitor thoughts, and before something bad happens, then they step in and do stuff. And with this whole data retention thing, I think it's pretty much the same, and Bundestrojana uh, as well. So you. You know, you can uh, monitor what people uh, do at the net, and of course, uh, then you have the hints what these people are maybe just uh, thinking, or if they, you know, just want to look up, for example, um, how, uh, you know, just of interest, how bombs are built, and uh, if you um, do are unlucky, and then you get into the focus of uh, police, we do have something like a thought control, but of course, it doesn't mean that people really want to build a bomb, so maybe they just want to look it up. Uh, and the effects of this massive, massive uh, surveillance uh, measurements are that, of course, everyone who's active on the internet, for example, bloggers, so they might um, are shy or they just don't dare to write about certain issues because they always have in the back of their heads, well, maybe if I write something about, you know, uh, terror, then my data record will start uh, to look suspicious and no, I'm not going to write about this and this and this issue because then maybe I will be in the focus of uh, police, so I better stop with this. And um, in the end, of course, you know, certain political engagement uh, will stay out of, out of the net and uh, self-censorship is... Um, yeah, what one of the effects that uh, will happen. And I'm not talking of radical engagement, I just talk about, you know, normal, nice, neat, democratic engagement. I mean, just uh, think of what happened to uh, Andre Heinz and his family, and his uh, partner just did a very impressive and uh, disturbing talk of what happened to them. Next issue is uh, preservation uh, of uh, information. So um, the internet, you know, could be uh, a dream come true. So you know, it could be like an endless source of every information people ever wrote of, like every um, artificial work or creative work. But it's very hard actually to preserve information. So then we have, for example, DRM. And if you have on um, Creative Works, you know, some DRM technology, it's really hard uh, to, to look these um, things up in a couple of years. For example, so if these, whatever, the, the, the service or if the hardware gets old um, or like no one else maintains these systems, then it's just kind of impossible to look them up in a couple of years. And of course, we do have the big problem of uh, proprietary standards and formats. I mean, just think of people who uh, wrote their PhD 10 years ago, and if you want to look it up today, it's pretty hard. And the uh, effect is here that a lot of digital knowledge uh, is uh, getting lost very, very uh, fast. So um, we have this huge paradox here that um, yeah, the internet could be or could function as our outsourced brain or it could be this um, endless uh, source of information and artificial works, but then we do have these forces of outbalance intellectual property rights, we have the soul cease and desist mania, we have the problem that um, net neutrality uh, is being undermined and then we have this excessive, excessive uh, security measures, and um, it all uh, results or sums up to that, uh, yes, uh, there's uh, scarcity entering uh, the internet as well. So it's not anymore the huge uh, 
plaque of uh, humankind, or like as humankind knows it from the analog world. And this is always having a very um, devastating effects on uh, civil rights and freedom rights. So um, my point here is, uh, yes, uh, we do need a framework for digital sustainability, and we just, uh, not, uh, we just shouldn't only think of this, um, you know, talking when we, um, we, just, uh, we just shouldn't apply this only uh, to the analog world, but as well, you know, to the virtual world, and I think we should bring this issue onto uh, political agendas, and I think we, put, we should bring this issue into academia as well, because academia concerning this issue is as well pretty silent, and it's important to bring it into people's minds. Okay, so now the question of the questions. So what kind of concept? Uh, I think we need kind of a meta concept, a concept everyone can connect to in order to um, uh, to, uh, to use networks effect, because, of course, today, you know, there are uh, copyright reformers, you know, fighting for a better copyright system, and, of course, we have people who are fighting for uh, net neutrality, and, of course, we have um, anti-surveillance activists, but these groups are pretty uh, separated. And uh, although, you know, they all um, they are... Um, their kind of their, their, their living environment is, is the net. So there is like a very connecting thing they have in common because they all kind of uh, are active in, the, uh, in, in, in one medium, uh, but uh, activists are pretty much separated. Separated, sorry. Um, and then I want to uh, talk briefly about a very smart text. It's called Environmentalism for the Net, and it's written by James Boyle, another American law professor. And he wrote this text 11 years ago, and it's uh, only about intellectual property rights. And he criticized in this text um, a lot that the intellectual property rights system kind of got hijacked by big uh, media uh, companies. And his concern was that we have to uh, protect the public domain. So public domain in Germany is something like um, gemeinfreie Werke, so uh, works where copyright has run out. And in this text, he uh, suggested uh, that um, copyright reformer or intellectual property rights reformer should uh, take the environmental movement as a role model because they um, managed to achieve some, something pretty smart, and this is uh, the introduction uh, of the concept of environment. So, um, um, how do I explain that? Um, it's like in the 50s of the last century, there really there were like some people um, starting to uh, worry about whatever dirty water or uh, polluted air, and then there were uh, people concerned with uh, protection of animal rights, but they were as well very separating. Uh, or they were like fighting for their causes, very separated, until. Um, they managed to come up with the concept of, uh, you know, the environment as a whole, and that there's a connection between polluted air and polluted water and, you know, whatever, dying of fish uh, species. And so this was uh, then a kind of a, an overall concept everyone could connect to, and uh, so or everyone could uh, identify with, because, of course, everyone is living in, a, uh, in an uh, environment. So and that, that was a pretty good concept, you know, to get into people's minds. And it kind of made the whole uh, movement uh, stronger. Uh, so I myself, I um, work with the term of sustainability, uh, digital sustainability. So why did I do that? Well, I think it's a good term uh, to hack media because everyone knows the term sustainability from this whole offline uh, Discussion and I think this term uh, open, open doors, opens doors um, because every school kid knows that oil is endless, but not everyone knows that uh, the internet does not function by itself, um, and not everyone knows that the internet uh, do need like a kind of a political concept or framework in order to protect what is so beautiful about it.
and so useful as well. Um, very quickly, so uh, yeah, what can you do or what can everyone do in order uh, to uh, yeah, protect the net and uh, to keep it as uh, so beautiful and cool how it is with all its great applications in it? Well, it's, if you are creative, if you do stuff, it's a good idea to put these works into the public domain or to use uh, Creative Commons licenses. Um, shall I take about what, talk about what Creative Commons is? No. <laughs> okay, very, very shortly, it's a, it's a licensing system. <laughs> So, but it, it gives um, creators and as well users of these creative works, you know, uh, it, it enables a more flexible handling of rights, so that's pretty nice. Okay, using uh, free software, open source software is as well a very nice idea, and of course, uh, all in all, um, it's, it's nice to uh, think, oh wow, stuff like data retention is such a bad idea, we should do something about it. Well, it's always the much better idea than to get active, for example, um, and, you know, just being active in whatever anti-surveillance issues or start to be active in a copyright reformer um, group, stuff like this. And all in all, it's always good to uh, know your rights and uh, fight for them. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm done. Okay. Thank you. And are there any questions? And uh, well, if you raise your hand. Thank you for your talk. Um, one of the things you mentioned is patents. Um, I often talk to people about patents. Um, I think you've been preaching to the converted here. I think we all agree with the things you've said, but. Um, I think we can only change these things by uh, spreading these ideas, ideas further. Yes. When I talk to people about patents, they explain to me that without patents, the chemical industry wouldn't work, the pharmaceutical industry wouldn't work, um, that the um, automobile industry wouldn't work, that engineering wouldn't work. Patents are absolutely necessary, and without patents, nothing would work. So patents are a good thing, and um, they can only be considered as such. Similarly with um, privacy, I have nothing to hide. That's the answer you get. How do you counter such arguments? I've, I've tried various things, mm -hmm. but um, it's a long-winded explanation. Do you have some catchy answers to these questions? Well, uh, you mentioned a very uh, important thing, because uh, what, what I always um, as well notice is it's so, um, I mean, you really have to have some, uh, you know, um, special knowledge in order really to understand these things. And it's so complicated because copyright system, patent system, or, you know, net neutrality before you have explained this, it's not so easy um, to um, understand. And I think that, the, or like everyone, you know, internet, let's call them like internet activists, they have this very disadvantage, for example, like everyone understands that, for example, killing these cute uh, whales is a very bad thing and it looks so ugly when they are like lying there in their blood. So that's pretty easy. So it's very easy to mobilize people against these things. But the internet is not bleeding and it's not very looking very cute, so it's hard to activate people. And I think how you can get them is when you really um, have examples where um, things really uh, got wrong. So and I think it's not a good idea to talk very abstract about this bad patent system, but when you, for example, you know, take these uh, examples of these very weird patents which exist, I think that helps. Um, do you it doesn't? Are there any more questions? Do you, do you really believe that there will be a, uh, a scarcity instead of a segregation? Uh, because it seems like the, the, the resource that you are measuring is uh, human creativity, which won't become depleted. Uh, but because people can set their own rules on the internet, uh, such as choosing Creative Commons over a more restrictive license, 
Uh, do, do you believe that there will be a scarcity versus a segregation of the internet into free and not free parts? I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. Do you think that there will be a segregation of the internet between free and non-free parts? Instead, yeah. of, a, uh, yeah. in, instead of a scarcity. Yeah, I think of, this can happen as well, but, but I wouldn't say instead of scarcity. But I mean, if you have, you know, some privileged elite which is having access to everything and the others do not have this, I think you have something like scarcity. My ears really start to hurt of this uh, technique here. <laughs> um, first of all, thanks for the talk for me as well. Um, just a short remark. It's not as if it isn't a problem with, uh, as if there wasn't a problem with pharmaceutical patents. Uh, I'm working a lot on drug prices, and you actually can see many people dying because of too high drug prices. But, but coming to the, to the main point I wanted to make, you're, you're introducing the the term of sustainability, digital yes. sustainability. Um, I'm a little bit doubtful whether this makes too much sense, so maybe you could define it uh, better, uh, de elaborate on it. what's the definition of that, because for me it has two problems, the term sustainability. One is that it comes from, from a language, from a field of scarcity. I mean the whole deb environmental debate is one about scarcity. That's where the term comes from, that's where daily uh, invented and so on and so forth. Uh, and the second one is in the environmental debate, we saw very easily how that term could be um, hijacked by the forces of evil. No, <laughs> no but by the, you, you hear things like sustainable growth by big uh, chemical companies. Mm -hmm. And I could imagine one important point, if, if I will be on, on the other side, important points to keep digital sustainability is to keep the internet free of filth, uh, to give enough, enough incentives and to prevent the internet from clogging. And this all could also be summed up mm -hmm. under sustainability. So is there a way to make it more, sustainable, uh, more specific? Otherwise, I see a really nice term on your web uh, address. Um, I, I could imagine um, talking more about the commons is, is a, another unifying term that would be less easy to capture and hijack. Well, um, I think commons is a, is a nice term as well, and of course there's, uh, you know, um, people who deal with this um, uh, term and they choose uh, commons and they did not choose uh, sustainability. So I just took this one, as I said in, in the one uh, of the last slides, because I think, you know, people can connect to this um, term because they know it from the offline world. and. Uh, Really, people, I mean, the message really got through, I think, to everyone that uh, we have to protect our environment, and this is very much tied to the term sustainability. But there are so many people who still think, uh, no, the Internet is free and open for everyone, and it's uh, paradise and what else, and there's, it's like kind of, um, it's just not having uh, these uh, problems. And then you said, so maybe it's, it can happen that this term can be kind of hi hijacked so that firms say, well, we do sustainability, uh, sustainable uh, development. Well, of course, I mean, this can always happen. I mean, the, the counterparts will always find some rhetorical uh, turnarounds in order to uh, kind of um, mess up your message. Of course, that can happen. Like my main idea was, it's just really like, when, when I talk to people who, who know what's going on, so like people who go to CCC congresses, of course they know really, yes, we have a problem with copyright, yes, we have a problem with net neutrality, yes, we have a big problem with the security measurements, but if you just step out of these people who already know about these issues, people really do say things like, well, why not monitor data traffic because I don't have anything to hide? So people like outside of the, uh, you know, let's say the people who know what's going on, it's, um, I think we do need tools in order to reach them because for them that's just not an issue. I think it's even worse than you said because I think 
We are even losing the freedoms in the analog world we had, we, we used to have, because uh, the, uh, the copyright holders are much more eager today now to close all gaps uh, in which content can, can escape. I even read an article that uh, children in the UK were forbidden to sing uh, Christmas songs because they were, not, uh, they, they were copyrighted. And so that's, that's something I, I think yeah, that would, would not have happened uh, a few years ago. Okay, I have a microphone. <laughs> okay, I would like to give a, an example for the question of the, for, for the fellow uh, at the wall. Um, with the division of the net in uh, free and non-free parts, I think. Uh, I believe in some areas the only possible division would be into a legal and illegal part. For example, uh, as Michael described, the patent system, which is kind of out of control regarding software, it also is a problem for free software. Free software authors can't do this patent clearings and research if their software violates patents and the patents get uh, more all the time and so on. So they will, given a specific legal climate, there will just be no possibility of putting free software on the net. So there will be a scarcity, or you will put it online illegal and anonymously, but you can't have a free part of the net if the laws forbid it. Uh, uh, boundaries, uh, legal boundaries on the net uh, are not limited by geographical borders anymore. Uh, because if you say this is illegal in this country, then what happens if it is illegal to use a hacking tool in Germany, but a German downloads it while in South America from a server in Egypt? Uh, you know, like completely outside of the, the legal jurisdictions of that particular uh, area, uh, you can't easily pin down laws to things that have no location. I think that's very optimistic, but I don't think we need to have a big discussion here. No. Do, do that in the bar. <laughs> do you want to, Michael, do you want to answer or do, shall I do the no. next question? <laughs> well, I sometimes wonder whether the mainstream opinion here that um, intellectual property, patent law and all that is, is starting to clog up the internet and stop progress from being made there is maybe um, too pessimistic, that maybe something um, else is the case that um, these changes that are required for other industries to adapt to the internet are taking, uh, are taking place not at the internet speed but at, at society's speed, which is still much slower. So um, basically we're screwing one industry at, at a time. We've basically done the music industry. The movies are kind of following now. And um, many, many other industries, like for example, I've seen figures about the pharmacy industry that has like 94% overhead in reproducing stuff, copycat drugs, that are being produced just because the other stuff is, um, has got a copyright pending. And we're seeing um, nations like China who don't really obey copyright law and to um, who are therefore much more productive. So I think, uh, I sometimes wonder whether maybe um, these uh, systems that are in place right now and that are based on analog um, production and IP uh, regulations or thoughts at least um, will turn out to be so ineffective that they, uh, although they are a a a right now being supported and uh, further supported by, by a law that is being made, will turn out to be so ineffective that they will just crumble at some point and that might be in, in a couple of years, it might be in a couple of decades, but that will happen. I don't know. I just take it as a, a nice comment, or do we do have a question with this? No. Are there people with real questions for Micah? Hey, well, it's another comment. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to comment on the notion of scarcity in like real life, like physical world around us, um, because I think that we also have a case of gatekeeping here and some areas where uh, we have a like, um, how to say that? Well, where we are in a situation where a lot of people are dying of hunger, but we actually don't have a scarcity of food. We are actually pr producing way more food than we We, we don't have what? A scarcity of? Food. Uh -huh. 
we are producing way more food than we would need to feed the world, but we're dumping a lot in litter or whatever, we're destroying it so we can keep the prices up. So I think this division between scarcity in physical, real life and in the digital world is questionable as well. I think some of the thoughts have come up in the digital world, like who are the gatekeepers who make things scarce, can also be implied on the like real world. And um, the same is true on the other way around as well. We do have some very strict like real world limitations on um, on the internet that creates scarcity there. Like we have a very um, non-balanced distribution of computers on this planet. We are talking from a very white, rich European point of view here. And I think that's uh, an effect of scarcity as well that we have like, I don't know, a very small percentage of the world population with the possibility of accessing this knowledge. So that's yeah, of course, we, we still have a huge digital divide. I just want to make clear, I mean, um, it's not about scarcity and it's not about that we cannot, you know, have access to certain whatever text, texts or creative works. Um, um, it's always having this whole copyright issue, for example, it's, very, it's having very harsh effects on uh, civil rights, yes? I mean, it's not about uh, consume, for example. And I as well think um, that this big separation between analog world and digital world already has ceased years ago, at least for people you know, in, the, in the Western societies. Yeah, um, two comments or maybe questions. Um, I, I, I actually, I really like your idea that, that we must uh, try to, to bring the different kind of movements much more together, the anti-copyright movement, the privacy movement and so on. Um, but I'm not really sure how, I'm, I'm from the privacy movement, uh, I'm not really sure how I can tell people that they have something to hide by talking about scarcity and sustainability. It, just doesn't connect at the first sight. Um, well, I think so, and actually, in fact, I want personal data to be a scarce resource. You want what? I want personal data, my data about yes. myself, yes. to be a very scarce resource that nobody can access without my knowledge and my agreement. You know, so um, I wonder um, if a uh, kind of a different term could, could be a bit more unifying. Um, in, in the context of the World Summit on the Information Society a few years ago, um, a lot of international uh, civil society groups came up with the concept of communication rights. Um, you know, that links uh, the right to, to also copy and to have fair use and stuff like that with uh, privacy rights and so on and other rights to free speech and so on. Um, it was also a bit difficult because some traditional human rights people disagreed with that and so on, but um, I also find it more, more strong in the end because if you argue for sustainability, you uh, basically say, yeah, there is this goal that we need to have a sustainable um, environment and sustainable policies and technologies and so on, so it's somewhere in the future and we have to get there. But if we talk about rights, we can say, it's my damn right, and I have it, it's in our constitution, and you know, it's a bit stronger, I would even say. I mean, that's always the thing with terms, you know, it always depends on with, with what kind of meaning you fill it up. And my main point here in this um, lecture was, well, first, I think we do need some kind of theory, right? Because that is just not really an issue, and I think it's a very, um, poor record for academia that they really don't focus on these issues much. So, I mean, I come from cultural sciences and I do give lectures at university, but there are very few who talk of these issues and I think that's a very a big mistake. So, I think first step is we do need to bring this somehow onto the agenda. And yes, scarcity as well. So I'm, for example, as well, very keen on my, you know, private information. And I am a blogger as well, and I never ever put any personal information into my blog. I only write about copyright things and free software things, but never personal. 
Um, so, I mean, and that, that's not for me a, a contrast when I talk of scarcity, because, I mean, in this frame, I mean, this, this is like a 30-minute lecture, and of course, I cannot be so accurate with terms and with the meaning. So my point here really is we just, I think it's important just to, to bring these issues up and that academia starts with, um, with, you know, focusing on this and we're focusing on our online environment as a whole. I'm from academia too and I absolutely agree with your um, um, saying we need more, more theoretical conceptual work on this. But can you tell me in one sentence how privacy and sustainability or being against scarcity fit together. I just don't get it. How privacy and sustainability fit together in one sentence. Okay, I'll try. Well, I think, um, <laughs> um, like, it's, it's um, like our, uh, it's, um, an internet which is having a kind of sustainable framework, so people um, should uh, kind of be able to decide what kind of data they have to make public for example, so that they are kind of, that, that they are able to, for example, keep data diets. I'm a big fan of keeping data diets. Um, yeah, so that, you know, people can um, kind of um, decide for themselves. And of course, that is, uh, what's not sustainable is something like data retention, because then you're not anymore the master or mistress of your data. It kind of gets hijacked by someone if you're unlucky. Okay. Uh, the, the last question for this room, and I guess that there is a bar next door <laughs> for another, uh, another long discussion, so <laughs> go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to try to give uh, an answer to that question. I think if, um, if privacy is something that uh, is in danger, because uh, you're under surveillance or you fear to uh, be open-minded and uh, articulate what you think, then sustainability in the net is uh, being in danger of, uh, and, and information becomes scarce. What? Well, all this is about democracy and the system and all that stuff, so you, I think I think if someone argues uh, what, what ha does that have to do together, you have to, s you have to think about some kind of uh, world you want to live in that deals with the same things, meaning your rights, in the meat space, in the offline world and the online world. So I think it belongs together. If you fear to, to, to say something or if you fear to, to lose your privacy, you won't feed the web anymore and then perhaps it dies or it just contains blockbuster movies. Yeah. Mike, Mike, do you ha have an answer? <laughs> no, I think it was a neat uh, no. comment. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let's end this session and thank Mike again for her nice speech and her answers. Thank you.